I was very kind and actually a very embarrassing introduction, but thank you very much. Um, my heartfelt thanks for you for coming out today and listening to uh, some research that we're conducting in, in my lab. Um, I appreciate your attendance and I'm overwhelmed by it. It's incredible to see this, uh, the support for this program, a program that I enjoy watching um, as well. And I want to begin by thanking many individuals who've helped out with this research. Um, it's fair to say that I've had um, a small army of students working in my lab, many of which are undergraduates, um, more than 40, that have participated in a number of the studies that I'll be describing today. And also a number of graduate students who have done part of their thesis work. And the um, thesis work has included elements of what I'll be talking about today. And I immediately want to single out one of these who's going to join me in a demonstration today. And that's Dr. Ryan McGinnis, who's up here in the front. And um, Ryan has contributed um, to several of the studies here through chapters of his dissertation work. Um, let me begin this by asking you, raise your hand if uh, you participated in any sport. <laughs> okay. Uh, raise your hand if you occasionally watch sports. Listen to sports news. Okay. Daily. Okay. Weekly. All right. So there's a strong connection uh, with all of us in sports. And it's fun to reflect maybe on why that is. Um, you know, clearly we are awed by athletic performance. Um, you know, here is Ali Reisman, who is the um, uh, captain of the U.S. Olympic team in 2012 and a winner of individual gold in floor exercise. And um, while we may not be able to perform like Ali here, um, we are nevertheless awed by athletic performance. And sometimes, um, among other unsung heroes, and uh, our own local um, champions that we enjoy watching day to day. And I wanted to start off by showing you who one of my heroes is and, and talk about uh, maybe her voyage through sports. So here are some images of my daughter, Stina, um, who happens to be a first year student at Michigan. And she may actually be in the audience and really embarrassed. I don't, I don't know. Hopefully she's sleeping in this morning. <laughs> but. Uh, Chances are this will get around to her. Um, Stina had done multiple sports as a, as a kid, and in high school really focused her attention on fast pitch softball. And um, she was encouraged to completely switch her hitting technique when she started in her first year. She naturally is a right-handed batter, and her coaches, recognizing that she had some speed, said, we want to change that. You're now going to bat from now on from the left side, and you're going to use a specialized technique in the sport of fast pitch softball known as slap hitting. And slap hitting allows you to take advantage of your speed, and it gets you a step or two closer to first base. So that was her entire role. But it required an entire rethinking and relearning of all the muscle control that she developed from the right side. So she struggled mightily in learning how to slap hit from the left side. It didn't come naturally. And she worked um, hundreds, if not thousands, of hours with uh, coaches um, in all the batting cage facilities we have around here. Um, our, our family, we spent hours working with her and those coaches. We spent log thousands of miles in our car traveling to tournaments around the state and in adjacent states and, and watching her play and encouraging. And so she definitely became our sort of local hero, doing something that was quite difficult for her to learn at first and um, uh, acquiring a new skill. But more importantly than that, I think the experience for us, um, it really changed our family. Um, my wife, Karen, will tell you that uh, she never watched sports until Stina started playing sports. And I'll tell you that my wife is an, an incredible sports fanatic these days, and she watches everything. Um, and it was really a connection to our daughter that did that. So I reflect on how sports affects us, and I think about the hours that I spent driving with Stina around the state and how the conversation changed from strategies about the upcoming game 
you know, highlights. It was not the win-loss record. It was not the plays or the errors. It was an opportunity for us just to connect for hours on end. And we would talk about everything that was important to her. Um, college applications. Um, the music that she enjoyed listening versus the music that I like to listen to. Um, so I think that's where I'd like to begin. Sports has a way of connecting us to people. Um, to people that we love, to people that we know, to absolute strangers on the street that we meet that look at the same champions, the same teams, and we connect with them immediately. So it has that effect on us. I'd now like to make a second connection. And that connection is uh, from sports to what I do as my day job here at the University of Michigan. Um, and Myron mentioned that um, my research is in several lines, but collectively, I focus on studying uh, things that move, uh, nonlinear and computational dynamics. But that's really just a term that describes the fact that I'm fascinated by motion and what makes things move. And the things that I study can be at various levels. We could be talking about um, mechanical devices, little robots, ground robots that run around, and we develop computer models to simulate how they move and how they navigate, how to build them better, faster. Um, all the way down to the nanoscale, where we look at the dynamics of uh, biomolecules and single molecule DNA, how it bends and twists and interacts with proteins, and how that alters cell function, control cell function. So I'm fascinated by how things move. And uh, some of that fascination is related to another line of research in our lab that is directly related to what I want to talk about today. So in my lab, um, one of the lines of research that we pursue is looking at human motion and how we quantify human motion and how we quantify performance. And we do so by advancing a technology, which is a wireless sensor technology that you can wear and you can use to non-invasively measure how people move. And while we'll be focused on sports today, I want you to realize that this is not just about sports. That the technology that we use in the lab um, and through collaborations with um, researchers university-wide, both here at Michigan and elsewhere, we're using this technology to study human health, uh, rehabilitation, uh, soldier performance, um, worker injury. And, and yes, it got its start looking at sports and athlete performance. So let me quickly give you uh, what the core idea is. And then from this, we'll spin out and we'll look at a bunch of examples. But the core idea um, traces back to actually a new sport that I was trying to learn about 15 years ago, one that better protects my, my old knees and, and elbows and joints. I started learning the sport of fly fishing. And we have a big enough audience here where I wonder, raise your hand if you know or you yourself have done any kind of fly fishing in the past. There must be a few. OK, excellent. And if you talk to my wife, she'll quickly tell you fly fishing is not a sport. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's uh, an affliction, it's an addiction, and it can waste a lot of time and money. And it can take you all over the world in pursuit of beautiful places to fly fish. Um, but if you have tried it, like me, you probably have stumbled uh, more than once in learning how to cast a fly line with a fly rod. Now, a fly line can be really, really long. We're trying to cast maybe... 30, 40, 50, 90 feet of fly line to a target out there where we believe the fish is lying. And to do that well takes a lot of fine motor skill and coordination, skill that I certainly did not possess when I took up the sport. And in fact, I was so frustrated with my ability to fly cast that um, being the researcher, I decided, well, I'll find out how people do it. And so I did what many of you would do. I, read books and uh, watch videos and took some lessons. And collectively, I don't think they helped me much, to be honest. Um, sometimes the instruction didn't make sense to me. Many times it actually was contradictory advice. And so I was really confused why some people that I saw were exquisite flycasters. It's beautiful 
when somebody does it right. And, and it was not beautiful to watch me. <laughs> so I, I wanted to understand why they did it so well. And I, I remember the day I was riding my bike home from work and the thought occurred to me that I need to measure how those experts cast and figure out what they do and why I'm not doing that in order for me to get better. So it was purely for selfish reasons. I wanted to become a better fly caster. But that's what led to the core idea that I want to show you here. And that idea uh, began with borrowing a technology that was developed um, originally for the automotive industry and then consumer electronics. And it has to do with the technology that comes from the MEMS industry, that's micro electrical mechanical systems, that are tiny little inertial sensors, such as these shown here. And these sensors come in two flavors. There are those that measure translation and those that measure rotation. The ones that measure translation are called accelerometers. They measure linear acceleration. And those that measure rotation are called angular rate gyros, how rapidly something rotates. And the notion that, that we had was how to combine these sensors and use them for something new. And we used the, the requisite combination of these sensors along with some wireless transceivers to create a wireless technology that we connect to um, sports equipment, like the knob of a baseball bat shown here. And that itself is only half of the issue or half of the challenge because the other half is what do you do with that information? How can you exploit that to determine how that fly caster casts or that softball batter bats or that golfer golfs? And so it led to a whole line of research in the lab starting about 15 years ago that I'm going to talk about here today. Um, we've also worked extensively with the University of Michigan Office of Technology Transfer and Commercialization to uh, capture the intellectual property behind this, and it has spun out into the marketplace in a number of different forms, some of which we can show you today. So it's a research um, uh, endeavor. It's also a commercialization endeavor. So here's what I want to talk about. Um, broadly, I want to talk about how we make these measurements. Um, what the measurements look like, what we do with those measurements, and how we distill these measurements to measures of athletic performance and specialized to various sports. And I'll do that by giving you some examples of projects from the lab that began as research projects and are now in the stream in the path towards commercialization, and some are out there in the marketplace already. So. Um, let me start by offering a, uh, an example technology here. I'm going to pass this around. And what I have on my fingers is what's shown in the fingers up there. There are a lot of people in this room. This will probably make its way around. And somebody at the end will be holding on to this, wondering what to do with it. If that's you, just bring it down to us. We'd like to use this again. But uh, you can pass that around. And it's a, um, a device that has a name. It's called an inertial measurement unit or an IMU, and it combines the sensors that you saw previously. It's about the size of a postage stamp, um, very lightweight, three grams, um, powered by battery, and it's skinnied up electronically so that it doesn't take up much space, and we can connect it to a lot of things. Um, let me tell you what it has, what it has on board. It has um, one of those devices I mentioned, an accelerometer, that measures acceleration in three directions simultaneously. So it's measuring three pieces of information. Acceleration along one direction, let's say x and y and z. I gather that together. In addition, it has on board uh, a combination of devices that collectively measure three other things. And these things are the spin rates of that printed circuit board. Uh, spin rates around one axis another axis, and a third axis. Those are the angular rate gyros. And you see that collectively, we are then measuring six pieces of information. Three acceleration components, and three spin rate components, or angular velocity components. And fundamentally, um, that is required to describe the motion of an object in space. Um, so for instance, if I wanted to, in 
if, you, if I were to ask you, take this um, device, this pointer, and place it somewhere in this room, and I'm going to give you the precise information for you to do that, I would have to give you six pieces of information. And I'd probably do, do that by telling you, well, take this corner of the device and put it in a coordinate system, x, y, and z, at a certain place. So I'll tell you x, I'll tell you y, I'll tell you z, and you can place that corner someplace in space. But then that's only half of what you need to know because you can rotate this thing arbitrarily about that corner and that's no good. I now need to tell you how to orient it. So I might then tell you, well, um, here is the roll angle, here is the pitch angle, and here is the yaw angle. And if I gave you those three angles, now you can not only locate it, you can orient it in a very precise manner according to my instruction. So minimally, you need six pieces of information. And fundamentally, you see that being done in this design. We're acquiring six pieces of information, though not position and not angles. We're measuring essentially rates of changes of those quantities. So the other side of this device has a little microcontroller that gathers those signals and converts it to digital form and prepares that for then um, um, connecting it to, sending it to a little low power wireless transceiver. And that pumps the signal to a host like a computer through a tiny little surface mount antenna. So as a little measurement device, that measures motion in a little package right there. So the measurements that we take fundamentally are two things. We measure acceleration and we measure spin rates or angular velocity. And those are vector quantities. And by themselves, they might tell us something about athletic performance, but that's not the whole story. What we typically want to do with them is we want to predict other things. Like, I might want to know the velocity of the sweet spot of this bat. In fact, you were just talking about that last week um, when we, then the discussion was all about the physics of baseball. So I might want to know um, what is the velocity of the sweet spot. I might want to know when I strike the ball and I impact it, what is the orientation of my bat in space? Where is the ball going to go? So I need to gather that information or calculate that information based on what those sensors are giving to me. And that involves um, something that we do in my lab. We do a lot of computational dynamics, and we do calculations based on that. So that necessarily involves uh, integrating that data over time, which brings into the picture a whole host of realities that you need to wrestle with. We need to understand how uh, to um, track the change in orientation of that device in space. Um, it's not held in one position. If I connect it to the bat, it's changing orientation consistently. And I need to know that in order to do these calculations. And that's one challenge. Another challenge is that accelerometer doesn't measure just the acceleration of the point. It also measures gravity. So gravity is superimposed. I need to subtract that out. And once I do that, I can then integrate in time to get from acceleration to velocity or get position, like the position of my hand. And doing so involves, um, unfortunately, the introduction of what's called drift error. And uh, we spend a lot of time in the lab. In fact, Ryan McGinnis here is an expert in identifying drift error and how to correct for drift error. That's sort of the secret sauce of what we do. So if you think about it, um, we have a technology that embeds some hardware and some software, does some calculations, and we can bring that to bear now understanding athletic performance. So I'm going to shift the focus here, and let's talk about some examples. And as a follow-on from what you talked about last week, um, let's focus first on baseball. So I can take that little wireless inertial measurement unit, add a battery, package it, put it on the back side of the knob of the bat here, and take some swings. And hopefully, we can use this to understand uh, the performance of a batter. Now, if you were to look at just the 
raw data coming off. This is what a bat swing would look like for a collegiate level baseball player, uh, now referenced in this abstract notion of looking at acceleration on the right and angular rates on the left. Kind of doesn't tell you much. In fact, it's probably confusing to us. Um, but that is the raw data that we're working with. And if you look at that, there's actually some trends in there that do make sense. Um, for instance, over here, when you're looking at the angular rates, you can see that the angular rate begins at zero. The bat is still. It ends at zero. The bat returns to being still. So this is the end of the swing. This is before the swing begins. Right in here is um, a time period where the bat is being um, brought to the set position up here. And the batter is now ready to swing. So following that, there is um, a little zone in here where the bat is again at rest. This is now the downswing of the bat, where it makes impact with the ball. And the rest of this is now the follow through after impact, that large rotation of the bat thereafter. So you can at least start to see some of the different phases of the motion, but it still doesn't tell you much about how good that swing is. Now, if you take this and, and you give the information and the data to somebody like, like Ryan over here, he can go through those calculations that I mentioned to deduce a whole bunch of things that you really might now want to know about a baseball bat swing. So things you might want to know include, um, OK, what does the swing look like in space? Um, what is the speed of the sweet spot? Um, how much bat speed did I generate? How long does it take for me to get from my set position to impact? That's sort of like my reaction. How quickly can I do that, among many other things? So here, for example, if you take that very same data that I showed you before, directly measured by that sensor, and you do the calculations that I've just described in words, you arrive at the following result. This is now um, not just a, an animation of the swing. This is driven by the data. And it shows what the swing would look like um, resolved in time. And I'm going to pause this about right there. So in this image, um, a three-dimensional motion of the bat is being shown. Um, the bat swing begins about right up here, where it's dark blue. And this is the downswing of the bat. And where it's colored red, that's the time that we detected impact with the ball. So that's the downswing. And you're seeing the image of the bat. They're actually being shown every 10 milliseconds before impact and right around impact every millisecond, which is basically our sampling rate from this device. We sample at about 1,000 hertz, and we can now calculate where the bat is every millisecond. And thereafter, what you see is um, a very graceful follow through. That bat is um, also half toned in maize and blue. So you can see how the bat rolls in space, and the bat is rolling during that follow through as you break your wrist in, in order to do that follow through. And then shown on the right hand side is uh, sort of a, an engineer's version of what you need to know about a baseball swing. Um, maybe not very consumer ready, but this is not product development, this is research. And what's being shown on the right are things like, um, well, what is your bat speed? So um, the bat speed at impact here uh, along the right-hand column was reported about 80 miles per hour. Um, it also shows how you aim the bat if you were square to the pitcher, yes or no. And it also shows something at the top which is very important and relates a lot to what you talked about last week, which is the time that it takes for you to swing this bat. So at the top, it says that this bat swing took um, 0.174 seconds, 174 milliseconds, let's call it 200 milliseconds. So it took me, not me, a collegiate player, 200 milliseconds to go from that set position down to bat at ball impact. Now 200 milliseconds is not very long, but unfortunately it is. If you consider the fact that in Major League Baseball, it takes about half a second for a fastball to be released from the pitcher's hand to make it to the catcher's glove. You've got only 500 milliseconds to play with. 
Now, 200 milliseconds is going to be consumed just by you going from point A to point B, which leaves only 300 milliseconds for you to make the decision and watch that ball come in and decide if you're going to swing or not and fire and make that swing. So that underscores the fact that you know hitting a fastball in Major League Baseball is one of the hardest things in all of sports. I mean, it's so hard that we measure success if you fail only two-thirds of the time, right? If you've got a batting average you know, that's above 300, that is fantastic. It is a challenge. And you can see why. Just the timing is very, very difficult. So there are a number of other things that you could do with this. Um, we could be looking at um, how you swung the bat and right at impact. Raise your hand if um, you've coached at all. Any Little League Baseball? OK. Raise your hand if you've been coached on how to swing. OK. So how often have you heard, I want you to swing the bat level? Give me a level swing. I need you to do a level swing. That swing's not level. <laughs> OK. And your coach is emphasizing, if your swing is level, when it comes to that hitting zone, um, the bat is in a horizontal plane at least that velocity vector is horizontal, and that gives you more opportunity to make contact with the ball that's also coming in kind of horizontally. But it's hard to see that. I mean, that's occurring in 50 milliseconds, right at the bottom of the swing. Good luck seeing that. So this technology is a way to measure that and quantify that, where we can determine if your swing is level, or if it's not, you might have a wicked uppercut in your swing which you might use in some game situations, or a chop coming down, which again, you might use in some game situations. But as we're learning the basics of swinging, we're all trying to develop that nice level swing. So we can measure that uppercut or chop to about the nearest degree. Um, we can also tell you where your bat was aimed. If you look in the upper right, you can see a bird's eye view looking down from above on that swing. And that red image is where the bat contacted the ball. And you can see something called the aim angle, uh, which um, is basically measuring the deviation from if you aim perfectly at the pitcher. So this bat is aimed slightly to the second base side of pitcher's mount and would hit, hopefully, between the gap between shortstop and second. Picture below shows a view from the catcher, and you have a nice swing plane developed there. And depending on your height and the length of the bat and where the ball is, you want to hit a certain swing plane. So these are just a fraction of the things that you could use to resolve uh, a swinging baseball bat. So what I'd like to do is segue, actually, to a demonstration of a version of this technology. I'm going to ask for Ryan's help. Um, what you've seen here is an, a prototype developed in the lab and some basic ideas that we've developed. But um, this idea has been picked up by a, a startup company that came to the University of Michigan um, that has now gone to the marketplace with a device that commercializes this idea. And the company is called Diamond Kinetics. Um, they will have a product on the market next month. And uh, for this Saturday morning physics, they sent me an early version of it that we want to use here. And as Ryan gets set up, we're also going to need um, maybe uh, a volunteer or two. Who wants to take a swing with a baseball bat and have it measured? Absolutely. Come on down. We were hoping somebody would jump. In fact, we got two. Come on down. OK. Yeah. Come on down. Yeah. With that sweatshirt. <laughs> that's OK. Well, well, that's why we created Photoshop. <laughs> OK, so the way this works is um, on the end of this knob of the bat is essentially the same technology that I showed you uh, in a different form developed by this company that embeds those same sensors together with a wireless transceiver. And this version sends that data wirelessly not to a clunky laptop, but to a smartphone. And on that smartphone is an app. Um, the app is what you're seeing here that uh, uh, can allow us to collect the swing data and then measure uh, that swing. And it will take just a little bit of instruction here. Um, nobody's seen this before. We're going to have to show them what to do here. 
So you swing from the right side? Yeah. Okay. What I'm going to ask you to do is stand right over here, well out of the way. And then from the right side, um, just um, line up where you'd like to swing. You might want to just hold the bat against the ball and, and measure up. And then before you take a swing, I'm going to ask you to hold the bat still. And then we'll say, go ahead and swing away. <laughs> Great. So Ryan, are you ready? Yes, we're good to go. Okay. So go ahead and, and hold it nice and still, the set position. That's great. Swing away. Okay. Looks good. All right. So why don't we very quickly get another measurement here, and then uh, we can talk about what's being displayed up there. And let's switch spots, just in case. Okay, so you know the drill. I want you to just measure up that ball, measure up that bat on the ball so you feel like you're going you're gonna to hit it, okay? And then hold it in the set position for a little bit. Swing away. Okay? Let's, we're going to ask you to do it again, okay? You want to hold it right there, measure it up. You might want to take a step closer, a little yeah. bit closer about like that. Looks good. Hold it and then bring it in the set position. Hold it nice and still. Okay, swing away. There we go. Okay. Those worked. Those worked. All right. That's the good news. No. It all, it's all good news. Um, so what this company has done is they've taken a lot of the ideas that we have described here, and they've drilled it down to define batting performance, and they measure it along uh, four axes. They look at, for instance, um, your control, your speed, your quickness, and your power. And uh, basically what they're doing is um, they're taking uh, measures of the bat speed at the sweet spot, measures of the bat orientation, how much control you had at impact. They're measuring the quickness, how quickly you could get from that set position down to impact, as we discussed. And then something they call power, which is a little bit more precisely, really, the momentum of the bat and the acceleration that you provided to that bat and converted to some scalar measure that they then call power. And they have used this to study the performance of um, players at various different levels. And you can be compared to, for example, skill level here is junior high. And you can now measure yourself um, against collegiate players, high school players, uh, professional players, etc., and uh, it'll report your your swing score. If any of you would like to try this afterwards, just come on down, and and we'll be happy to uh, give you an opportunity to swing. So thank you very much for that. So um, baseball, lots and lots and lots of motion. You're going to ask me to. Thank you. So baseball, lots and lots of things move. It's not all about bats, <laughs> right? So why not apply this to the baseball itself? After all, we'd like to know about the motion of the baseball. We'd like to know about pitching mechanics and, and develop a tool for training pitchers. So this actually was something that Ryan did as part of his doctoral dissertation. Maybe one of the very first chapters in his doctoral dissertation was to figure out how I can use this technology to measure pitching performance. So um, this is a slightly different version of the technology you saw before. This is another generation that Ryan used to embed inside of a pitch baseball. And um, among the many things you might want to learn about pitching a baseball, uh, a lot comes down to, well, what was the flight of that ball? Um, was that a curveball? Was that a slider? Was that a fastball? Um, how much did it break? How much did it deviate from a straight line as I threw it? And why did that occur? Well, fundamentally, it occurs because of the aerodynamic forces acting on the ball, and particularly the laces that will call that, cause that trajectory to curve. Now, how does that process begin? It begins by how the ball is released from your fingers. When you release that baseball, you know a professional pitcher is doing two things, right? 
he's imparting a tremendous amount of velocity to the center of that ball, but also, depending on the pitch, a tremendous amount of spin. And how it is spun relative to the velocity at release will dictate the flight path thereafter. So of all the things that one could measure, what you certainly want to measure are the release conditions of the ball from your fingertips. And by that I mean you want to know the velocity of the ball and the spin of the ball at release. So Ryan came up with this um, idea and a clever way of describing it that's illustrated in these figures off to the side, which uh, in a snapshot distinguishes three major types of, cur of balls that are thrown. In the upper right, we have a fastball. Now, how do we know that's a fastball? Well, if I were to throw a fastball, like a four-seam fastball, I'm throwing it, and as I release it, I'm throwing it with a tremendous amount of backspin. It rolls off my fingers like that, and it's spinning like this. And if I were to use the thumb of my right hand to describe how it would spin, my thumb would point directly to you. It's spinning about my thumb. And if you look up there and you look at the green arrow in the upper right, that is the spin axis of the ball in a fastball pitch. And it's pointing right out at you if that were down rotated slightly. That is direction out towards you relative to the direction that it's traveling, which is shown by the blue arrow in the upper right, which is the velocity of the ball center. So that is the hallmark of a fastball. It's pitched with a ton of backspin. Now by contrast, if I want to throw a curveball, I'm releasing that ball like this with a tremendous amount of top spin. So it takes the spin axis that used to be pointing towards you and it flips it to the other side of the ball. And that's what you see in the lower right over here. That curveball, that green arrow is now flipped about 180 degrees from where it was before as a fastball. And the velocity of the ball center, pretty much the same. So if I want to distinguish between fastball and curveball, what I need to pay attention to is where is that spin axis? How much spin have I developed about that spin axis? And that will dictate the flight of the ball thereafter. Now for a slider, a slider breaks horizontally, breaks in the horizontal plane, right? Might, goes, might go in on a batter, or might go out on a batter. And now the spin axis is pointing upwards exactly how you'd expect. That ball is thrown with a ton of side spin. Okay, so the notion here is that you could use this technology to um, measure and quantify different types of pitches, how well you're throwing these pitches. Is that a pure fastball? Never is. How much of a slider on top of your fastball are you throwing? And so just by studying the quadrants where these vectors lie, you can now measure and quantify pitch types. Um, that's an idea that has not yet been commercialized, but um, there's a, a partner company that we have that would like to do so in the near future. All right, different sport. Let's do something indoors. Um, let's talk about bowling. And going from baseball to bowling is great because um, a bowling ball spins like crazy. And um, I, I don't know if, if you've, um, bowl a lot, maybe a few of you do, and maybe a few of you can actually do this with your bowling ball. I certainly cannot. But if you look at that ball, it's going down the lane, and then it just hooks. It bends. The path of the ball changes. And it's changing in the lane intentionally in order to hit that pocket for a strike. And the bending of the ball path in the lane, called the hook, is something that is really the hallmark of a professional bowler. Um, and you might wonder how that develops. Well, this technology can reveal that. You can take those devices, you can bury them in a ball using a device called a thumb slug, and uh, now we can measure the dynamics of a bowling ball um, Certainly as it's in your hand and how you set things up, how you release the ball, and then the motion of the ball down the lane. So this is an idea that is being used by one of the um, uh, companies in bowling, Ebonite. They make bowling balls, and um, they're coming to market someday soon, we hope, with their own version of this that measures bowling skill. 
But one of the things that we were puzzled with early on is um, exactly what are those professional bowlers doing that allows that ball to hook? And when are they developing that skill? And how is that coming about during their throw? And, and what I want to show you here now is uh, that technology being used on a professional bowler. And there'll be a video above. But below that video and synchronized with it is data from our sensor that measures one thing. And that's going to be the spin rate of the ball, what they would call the rev rate of the ball. It's being measured in RPM, revolutions per minute. And that rev rate is going to be uh, shown as a function of time. Um, during the portion of time where the, the bowler is coming uh, down in their forward swing, like so, and then releasing the ball onto the lane. So it's just focused down there where basically the release of the ball is occurring. So if you look at that, um, there's obviously a big change in the spin rate of the ball. And that spin rate is being developed over a very short period of time. I'm going to play this through once. And then I'm going to pause it. And we're going to focus in on where that action is occurring. So I'm going to pause it about right there. Oh, bad move. Let's try again. And about, oh, come on, be kind to me. Maybe I won't. OK, I'm just going to point to it. So um, all along here, the ball is developing some spin, some angular velocity. And it's doing so largely through this, if you'd like, a pendulum motion of swinging your arm with the ball. That's all it is. And it's not very fast spin rate. It's only 100 revolutions per minute, let's say. But shortly thereafter, it, it heads upwards. And it heads upwards to north of 400 RPM. And what's happening in that little time interval is the following. That bowler got three fingers on the ball, right? Got your thumb, right? We have two fingers. And at the very bottom of that pendulum motion, the bowler is popping their thumb out of the ball. The ball isn't released yet, just their thumb. And slowly turning their hand a little bit to the side, and then they're pulling upwards on the side of the ball with their remaining two fingers to cause a tremendous amount of side spin to that ball. And that side spin is being added to this pendulum motion and other spin to account for that 400 RPM final spin rate at release. And it's that side spin that is being developed that later in the lane allows the ball to hook as friction drives it in that direction. So if I play this again, look carefully at the bowler's hand and the fingers. And you'll see um, the fingers come flying out of the ball at the end, and as that ball develops that side spin. So right in this zone coming up, watch the hand. The fingers flick right out of the ball right there. And that's what professional bowlers do. Um, not what I do. <laughs> so if you have that information um, and a lot of other information, you can now try to understand bowling. And this is sort of the engineer's view of what bowling would look like. And this is not a product, but this is an idea and a concept validated through lots of experiments. And we can measure a lot of things about bowling. You might want to know um, your velocity at release. So shown on that. Uh, Bar graph on the right is your release velocity in miles per hour. Side to that is your spin rate, your rev rate, or RPM. We can also tell you very precisely where your spin axis lies on the ball. And that's really important for determining how the ball will, will perform down the lane, among many other things. OK, um, another ball, another sport, an indoor sport. Um, so one of my graduate students early on who was working on this line of research um, was fascinated with basketball. And he thought, well, boy, we're doing it for bowling. Let's do it in a basketball. And we thought, Kevin, you know, that's not such a good idea. I mean, how are we going to get in the ball? The ball deforms like crazy. And what in the world do you think you're going to measure to would indicate 
uh, performance in that sport. But with the help of a company, a startup company that he ultimately joined, they created a technology, a version of this that is now used for the sport of basketball. Um, and they embedded it in an inflatable ball, did all the engineering to get that done right, counterweighting it, balancing, etc. And they have now a technology on the market that's used to measure uh, ball handling skill and shooting skill. Um, I don't know if anybody actually has seen it here. Maybe you have. I understood it was being sold at our local um, Apple store. Um, has anybody seen a 9450 basketball? Curious? Not yet. Okay. Um, oh, you have? Cool. So um, that came as a research project in our lab that went all the way through the commercialization process and um, is now out there as a product that, again, is being used to teach ball handling skill. And this company began um, their work by doing a, a an incredible number of trials of looking at basketball players nationwide at all levels, uh, professional level, collegiate level, COIO level, and they developed a, a fundamental understanding of how to use a technology to distinguish uh, ball handling skill and shooting skill, and then have baked that into their product, now in the form of an app on an iPhone that you can use to measure ball handling skill. Okay. Um, I'm going to wind down here soon, and what I want to do next is um, simply describe that the, it started out as uh, a way to improve my fly casting um, evolved. Um, and it didn't happen overnight, uh, and it didn't happen just by me, it happened with a ton of people. Uh, students in my lab, um, commercialization partners outside of our lab, and um, also, uh, the good use of our uh, Office of Technology Transfer and Commercialization and their staff. Um, but we've partnered with a number of companies now uh, to develop this for uh, the sports that are identified here. Um, and some are out there already in the marketplace, and others will be quite soon. Um, so uh, all the way from a, a very modest and small sport like fly fishing to things like now football and tennis and baseball and basketball. So with that, um, I want to thank um, those sponsors and our commercialization partners, and above all, just thank you for your very kind attention and patience with us this morning. And I uh, appreciate your, your good, kind attention. Thank you very much. <laughs>